Good afternoon and welcome everybody. I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your day to attend this webinar. Uh, so let me be begin with an introduction. My name is Joe Marroquin. I'm a research engineer in the Fluids Engineering Department here at Southwest Research Institute. And my background is in mechanical engineering. I have been at SWERI for approximately 10 years and have been involved in multitude of projects related to chemical pilot plant design and operation, multi-phase fluid studies, and recently been involved in research efforts related to artificial lift. Uh, with that said, let's get started. This is the webinar for artificial lift testing methods. Uh, the webinar will be broken up in a few sections. Uh, initially, I will explain what artificial lift is and give a little information on artificial lift technologies, specifically focusing on gas lift and electric submersible pumps or ESPs. Uh, the reason these will be highlighted here is that uh, gas lift and ESPs will be represented in three case studies. I will show a little bit later on in this webinar. So it would be beneficial to provide a little background knowledge on these technologies. What is artificial lift? Artificial lift is a method of increasing pressure within an oil and gas reservoir with the intent of maximizing hydrocarbon recovery. Historically, artificial lift has been primarily used on wells with insufficient pressure, known as depleted wells. But now in an effort to increase production, its use has also been utilized in uh, naturally flowing wells. In total, there are approximately 1 million wells utilizing artificial lift worldwide some form of artificial lift is utilized in just above 90 percent of wells in the U in the u.s although there are many forms of artificial lift they can be typically broken down into two main categories gas lifts and pump systems use of artificial lift systems has increased significantly as the oil and gas industry continues to adopt cost-effective solutions to optimize production further increases are anticipated as north american unconventional wells or shale fields will likely adopt artificial lift once their production rates start declining. So as that's, with that being said, our artificial lift can reduce lifting costs and optimize production, making it a vital uh, product to the oil and gas industry going forward. So as we move into a scenario where uh, nearly all wells will be using some form of artificial lift, it's imperative that the failure modes be well understood. So this can be accomplished through independent validation and performance testing with the hope of improving industry by increasing operation lifetime, thereby reducing workovers and production downtime. Uh, so I realize the pictures here may be a little hard to read because there's a lot packed into this one slide, but uh, they represent the variety of artificial lift technologies. Uh, so shown, shown here are the schematic representations of gas lift, electric submersible pumps, progressive cavity pumps, hydraulic pumps, and beam pumps, which of course uh, may be the most uh, recognizable of all of these technologies. So this type of pump also goes by several names, rocking horse, sucker rod pump, grasshopper pump, and several others. So beam, beam pumps are the oldest and most common uh, uh, artificial lift. So as I was showing in the next slide, there's some advantages to each type and, and reasons to employ one method over another. The figure above illustrates the typical operating regime for each major artificial lift method. As shown in the table, ESPs are a high throughput type of lift that can be used in deep wells. Progressive cavity pumps and rod pumps or beam pumps are mid-range in terms of throughput, but limited to shallow wells due to uh, efficiency losses of the pump system. Gas lifts are effective on lower rate applications as production is tied to many design factors, such as tubing size, gas injection rate, and well depth. The lower figure represents a global breakdown of artificial lift units. As mentioned earlier, rod pumps are the leading lift method globally followed by gas lifts, ESPs, and PCPs. So what is interesting is that although each of these artificial lifts is designed for a specific application and reservoir condition, the usage of each tends to vary by region as operators are typically using what they're comfortable or familiar with and just kind of stick with that, whether it's the best fit for the application or not. 
Uh, as an example of this, the product mix of artificial lithium used in Asia is fairly even across all technologies, while Russia relies heavily on ESPs, and North America has been the primary driver for gas lift due to the unconventional well boom uh, seen in recent years. So this tech is heavily represented in shale fields where, where natural gas is readily available. As I mentioned earlier, in the next few sl slides, I'm going to provide a detailed explanation of gas lifts and ESPs, as these are the methods experiencing the most growth worldwide, and they represent the equipment, uh, equipment evaluated in my case studies. So what is gas lift? A uh, gas lift is a widely used artificial lift method, which works by injecting compressed gas into a well to re-establish reservoir pressure, making it produce. Uh, the injection of the gas works as a lift mechanism because it reduces the weight of the hydrostatic column, thus reducing the back pressure and then allowing the reservoir to push the mixture of produced fluids and gas up to the surface. So gas lifted wells are equipped with side pocket mandrels and a series of gas injection valves. So this arrangement allows for gas injection deep in the tubing. The injection of the gas into the fluid stream reduces the fluid density, lowers the bottom hole pressure, and thus, as the gas rises, the bubbles help push the oil to the surface. So the degree of this lift effect depends on whether the gas injection is continuous or intermittent and whether the gas is injected at a single point below the fluid or supplemented by multi-point injection along the tubing string. So this can be further explained in the simplified schematic to the right. The reduced pressure of the tubing section provided by the injected gas, shown as 1000 psi on my sketch, uh, becomes less than the formation pressure, shown as 1500 psi. So by the injection of the gas, you are in, in effect now having 500 psi of differential pressure to to produce the well fluids so that's basically the idea it's a little more complex than the schematic shows but uh, that's basically the idea so let's talk about some advantages of gas lift um, this process of lift actually resembles natural well flow and is basically an enhancement of that process Gas lifts can cope well with abrasive elements and sand, with the cost of work over being minimum when compared to other, other methods. The gas lift system also has some disadvantages though. There has to be a source of gas, so if no gas is available, this type of lift is not feasible. It has a high initial capital cost as proper installation and compatibility of gas lift equipment at the surface and in the wellbore are essential to any gas lift system. And they can be maintenance intensive due to all the components. Gas lifts are also limited by viscosity. So if the fluid's too heavy, the gas can't push it up. And there are some findings of flow assurance problems, such as hydrate formation, that can be triggered by the action of the gas lift. Um, so for the next few slides, I'm going to provide similar details for ESPs. So the picture to the left kind of shows an, an ESP assembly. Um, an ESP is an artificial lift system that utilizes a downhole pump that is electrically driven. It's a multi-component system, typically made up of several stage centrifugal pump sections that can be specifically configured to suit the production application. So the whole system is installed at the bottom of the tubing string with an electric cable running the entire length of the well and it connects the motor which is the lowest component to the surface uh, source of electricity in this case shown as the controller or VFD. Um, the ESP applies fluid lift by rotation of the impellers which generates pressure on the surrounding fluids. This forces them to the surface. Uh, so the ESP is, is can lift more than 25,000 barrels of fluid per day with uh, variable, variable, variable speed controllers um, can extend this range both on the high end and low end. So the ESP, uh, ESP's main components include a multi-state centrifugal pump, 
a three-phase induction motor, which is cooled from flow from the process fluids, a seal chamber section, which is used to protect the produced fluids from entering the electrical motor, and also to absorb thrust, a power cable, and surface components such as a VFD or flow control valves. Intake components uh, can also be utilized, and they vary depending on the reservoir conditions. This can be uh, sand filtration, uh, gas separation, different different uh, things depending on the scenario. ESP internals uh, can be classified. So on this slide, showing uh, typical ESP stage types. Uh, the ESP internals can be classified as, into two main categories, radio flow and mixed flow pump stages, with each having benefits depending on the well conditions. As you can see on the slide, radio pump stages are shorter and thus have more stages installed for a given pump length, while radio pumps are typically associated with lower flow rates and a production fluid that is low in solids and gas content. You can see that because they're packed so tight. You can see the interfaces are very small, so um, likely wouldn't be great at handling, so handling solids or, or gases. Um, a mixed flow pump has stages that are significantly taller than a radio flow type and are associated with less lift per stage and higher flow rates. This type of pump, the mixed flow type, is a better option for gas, solids, and viscosity handling due to the less restrictive flow channels. So why would an ESP be deployed? Well, it is a high rate, high drawdown form of lift. It is very effective in high water cut, low GVF, and low solids environments, uh, typically about six to 10 weight percent of solids. The typical GVF limit of a centrifugal pump a uh, centrifugal ESP pump is about 10 to 30 percent, but it depends on the stage type and intake pressure. Though gas and solid separations de devices can be deployed, which can help in high solids and high GVF environments. And they also can be installed in highly inclined uh, and, and horizontal wells. So the disadvantages of, of an ESP are Producing solids or operating near the GVF limits can significantly reduce pump life. Erosion can also occur fairly easily because of the tight tolerances of the pump components. Also, if gas lock occurs, the pump will continue to rotate with no fluid movement and the result being a failure of a, uh, the ESP motor because there's, like I mentioned earlier, the process fluid is, is flown over the motor and that's what actually cools down the motor. So if there's no fluid movement, there's no cooling, and the motor is eventually going to overheat and fail. And ESPs also, another disadvantage of ESPs, they also have a, typically have a high initial capital cost and a high remediation cost. And they also require highly trained personnel, uh, highly trained personnel for installation and operation. So now that I've explained some of these technologies, I'd like to go over a few case studies highlighting artificial lift investigations here at the Institute. For this particular case study, case number, number one, the background of this project was that an operator was developing an offshore field and it was determined that gas lift should be installed as in the completion as it, it is the best method to maximize the returns. So due to the temperatures and pressures of the reservoir at this uh, field, a gas lift valve technology did not exist that met the operator's performance requirements. So the operator prompted a development of technology through several manufacturers and worked out a plan to validate the resulting technology. This new gas lift valve had to be validated prior to installation in the well. Because if the gas lift valve were to fail, Intervention costs could range from 8 to 12 million, including recovery cost and downtime. So for this operator, it was worth it to test if the valve 
at well bore conditions uh, in order to reduce the risk of failure downhole. So the approach for the validation plan of the gas lift valve required multiple elements, including static pressure tests of the packing, static pressure tests for backflow integrity, erosion testing simulations for liquid unloading, mandrel qualification testing, and dynamic flow testing of the lift valve. This requirement was specifically important because no independent facility existed to meet the test conditions. So the goal of this project was to simulate the life cycle of the lift valve, otherwise known as the check dart, and determine if chattering occurred and at what flow regime this happened. So chattering, if you don't know, chattering of the check dart valve is a typical occurrence for gas lift systems and it can lead to damage and reduce lifespan of the gas lift assembly. This will ultimately lead, need to be removed from service and repaired or replaced. So if the equipment is operated in this flow regime, which causes chatter for extended periods of time, it can lead to frequent interventions and of course, well downtime. So the third element of this project was to test the back check seal performance after an equivalent of 10 and a half years of operation. So as I mentioned, um, most of these uh, testing components wanted to, uh, were needing to be done in a dynamic type flow situation. So. so since an independent facility did not exist to meet this need, uh, the next step was to design one. Uh, so this, this project was the culmination of several years of coordination between Swery and the customer. Uh, from facility conception in, in mid-year 2013 to an iterative process to design a test facility meeting all the customer specs and to finally test operation. So the end result, as you can see from the timeline and the, the, the real life picture down there in the corner, was a resource that the customer and others in industry could leverage that had enough flex flexibility built in to test multiple variants of uh, gas-dominated flow products. And we called this facility the Gas Lift T Test Facility, or GLTF. So um, you can get a scale of the site. Here's an overview picture of the Gas Lift Test Facility, uh, highlighting some of the major components. So the control room for the facility you can't see, but it's uh, remotely located. So all of this activity that's happening in this test facility can be remotely uh, operated. So it's a little safer as far as operation because you're dealing with uh, highly compressed gas, high pressures, high flow rates, you know, some noise. Uh, so. so here's a zoomed in photograph of the GLTF. So in the background, uh, the bank of high pressure gas compressors can be seen. Those are the guys that are in blue there in the background. Um, the gas lift text, test fixture can also be seen in the foreground mounted to the yellow structure. And we have some other components there, some chillers, um, a methane volume, a, a gas distribution panel, um, which are all integral to the test. So as part of our test plan to guide the dynamic testing, a CFD analysis was performed uh, to predict the flow rate regime which caused or increased chattering. This analysis provided data to the operator which, which also helped in sizing and modifying this design of the gas lift valve for optimization. The data was, was further used to guide the, the conditions where during the dynamic flow testing where chattering would likely occur. This help kind of get us a upper and lower bounds uh, for kind of guiding the dynamic testing. The... Here's some graphics uh, representing that portion of the dynamic flow testing. Um, so during the dynamic flow test at, at field conditions, a uh, specific flow regime was found to create the valve chatter condition as, as shown in the charts. Ultimately, this data led to recommendations for which flow regimes to avoid in order to operate outside the critical range. The measurement was accomplished using dynamic pressure transmitters and accelerometers strategically placed on the test article and required high speed data acquisition somewhere in the kilohertz range 
So this is an important discovery because this type of instrumentation could not be deployed in the field and this chatter would otherwise remain unconfirmed. Maybe speculated, but unconfirmed. Um, so other me measurements were explored, such as microphones or acoustic technologies, thinking that these types could also be employed in the deployed in the field as a check for when chattering was occurring. Um, but uh, we were unsuccessful at, at detection of the valve chatter using these acoustic technologies. So what was the benefit to operator for this project? Flow performance was measured against CFD models, resulting in optimal sizing of the components uh, for the given flow scenario. Life's, uh, life cycle flow tests on the valve indicated potential design improvements, which were implemented, possibly preventing premature failures of the equipment and reducing interventions. So using CFD and dynamic testing, a flow rate range was identified that promoted chattering of the gas lift back check. So this provided the operator with valuable information. So it indicated that what flow scenarios to avoid, again, preventing premature failures of equipment and interventions. So the end result is a customer has access to the complete facility that can be leveraged as a resource Lots of flexibility built in, so they, we can use this for several different gas-dominated flow product testing. And anytime they're looking to bring a new design to market, we can go right to uh, CFD analysis, uh, check on uh, where the chatter may occur, and then dynamic flow testing to confirm or verify that. Um, For my case study number two, uh, we're going to focus on a project initiated for performance evaluation of an ESP at high viscosity conditions. So life lifespan of an ESP can vary from a few years to a few days. The actual lifespan depends on a lot of factors, uh, including what is produced from the well, whether it's a gassy well, sandy well, high water content, etc. Uh, down to the quality of the power that is supplied to the motor. While SURI has performed validation tests for ESP manufacturers to test the lifespan of ESPs in challenging environments, this case study is going to focus on the request for uh, flow performance at highly viscous conditions. Uh, so the picture shown here is a test facility that was designed and constructed by SURI on-site uh, to meet the customer needs per for performance evaluation of a multi-stage ESP at varying viscosity conditions. So what was the goal of this project? An operator provided an ESP manufacturer with a set of requirements for their planned completion. So while the manufacturer already had the technology developed, there was not any real performance data with any fluids other than water. So this operator wanted confirmation that that ESP system they were going to purchase uh, would meet the performance and efficiency requires, uh, requirements for their field. So as a result, the manufacturer of this uh, ESP reached out to SWERI to help validate their technology. At several, we, They wanted to do this at several operating frequencies with the ability to perform dynamic flow testing ranging from 1 centipoise up to 4,300 centipoise. Uh, so, again, this, this type of facility did not exist uh, other than on maybe a, manu a pump manufacturer site. And for an operator that may not feel independent enough, um, they're basically a manufacturer evaluating their own product. Um, so, so the, uh, the goal of this test was to, to do a pump performance evaluation with viscous fluids which is typically, pump performance is typically evaluated using just water data with correlations imposed for uh, correcting the water data to uh, viscous fluid. So with this testing, the manufacturer uh, was looking to refine their hydro hydraulic models using real fluids and to confirm performance uh, for their operator. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, this facility was not developed, so the, the result is uh, kind of what's shown in this picture. 
this is not the same as the one that was shown earlier. This is actually another project assembly uh, for ESP performance evaluation. So you can see that we're a little bit flexible as, as far as what test fixtures will come into to this facility. So the end result is this uh, this facility we called the SWERI HVFL for high viscosity flow loop. So this picture highlights the major components of the high viscosity test facility. Uh, so you can see our control room in the back. We got uh, several oil storage tanks, a test supply tank, a heat exchanger, some flow control valves, and some Coriolis meters. Uh, what's not shown here is the test article or a couple of other things that you really can't see. Um, for this facility, controls and monitoring for all the automated components uh, is performed in the control room uh, via a, a custom national instruments data acquisition system and a lab view control application. So here's a, uh, there's a diagram schematic of the high viscosity flow facility kind of to easier to explain uh, what's going on with this test loop. Um, so the high viscosity uh, HVFL consists of two closed loops, a test section loop supplied by the booster pump there at the bottom, and a secondary loop which circulates test fluid through a heat exchanger and back into the supply tank to control fluid temperature, uh, or in our case, viscosity, since viscosity and fluid temperature are intertwined. Um, so in order for to maintain steady state conditions at the test article inlet, in this case the pump, uh, we really had to keep tight control on that fluid temperature. So regulating, regulation of flow and pressure drop within the test section depends on several control valves in the metering manifold. You can see that kind of down there where it says flow measurement manifold. Uh, so these valves were sized to minimize pressure drop while also providing a fine level of flow control over ranges from 10 to 1200 GPM. Fluid flow rate is monitored via two micromotion Coriolis flow meters sized for high accuracy at both the high and flow uh, high and low flow conditions. And again, the controls and monitoring of all this these uh, automated systems are done in a separate control room. Uh, so to meet the client needs, several oils were sourced for this project and stored on site. So we maintain on site an inventory of about uh, 4,000 gallons of five different types of oils. So this gives us a potential viscosity range of 5 to 5,000 centipoise. So this graphic uh, was not updated with the newest oil acquired, but uh, we are now able to achieve as low as 5 centipoise. Um, water is also available for the testing uh, for baseline performance data at 1 centipoise. Um, so these fluid profiles here shown on this chart were actually generated at one of our uh, rheology laboratories and they gave us uh, with their data we're able to generate a temperature versus viscosity profile for each of our fluid this really guides our control point customer says we need to control to 4300 centipoise we know what fluid we need to use and what temperature we need to target for our uh, inlet conditions so, so um, For this case study, uh, due to the proprietary nature of the test, the data was presented here in a non-dimensional form. But for this uh, for this particular scenario of a fixed viscosity at a changing pump frequency, you can still observe some trends even though the data doesn't have any dimensions to it. Each line on these graphics represents a pump speed setting and several flow points at that condition. What can be seen here is that the overall head and throughput produced by the pump drops off significantly with decreasing pump speed at a particular viscosity condition. A similar decreases in a pump efficiency is seen as well. So what's shown here only represents one set of data at a fixed viscos viscosity. Approximately 20 similar performance plots were generated for this ESP at various viscosities that are within the HVFL's operational envelope. So for the manufacturer, this data allowed them to optimize their viscosity correction models for this ESP variant at any given fluid viscosity. 
It also better positioned them to do proper equipment sizing and selection based on the particular operation conditions. Um, so what the customer was looking for with this facility was uh, the ability to control viscosity from 1 to 4,300 centipoise, a flow rate up to 1,200 GPM, an inlet pressure up to 100 PSI, and a discharge pressure up to 750 PSI. So all components and systems uh, were designed to basically fit within that regime of what they were looking for. So all the findings of the test program uh, were used to improve performance models against real fluids and uh, can be further utilized to enhance product design for other products. So as I mentioned before, pump performance with, with viscous fluids is typically estimated by correction factors from water data, uh, typically based on correlation calculations from uh, places like the Hydraulic Institute of America, but there are several others that are used out there uh, worldwide. So data analysis has shown the error margins can, can be over 40% for correction factors versus testing, versus physical testing with model fluids. So this could potentially lead to overestimation of performance or undersizing of equipment, which in either case would lead to decreased production and possibly a short uh, lifespan. So as I mentioned before, this, this test loop was highly instrumented and it allowed for interstage measurements of the multi-stage pump. So this allowed for verification of pressure boosts at each stage rather than a single overall DP value. So you could see whether uh, at each stage the pump was, was doing what it was supposed to be doing. Also during this testing, the customer received data that allowed them to deter determine the best efficiency point, or BAP, uh, for pump operation based on fluid viscosity, pump speed, and flow rate. Um, to just basically verify that when it's deployed in the field, they are in fact sizing it right, and it is, it is operating at its highest efficiency with that given scenario. So the data that was gathered by us and provided to our customer ultimately uh, gave their customer, the operator, confidence that the equipment would work in the field application. From a third case study, uh, and this particular project, the ESP manufacturer was looking to confirm observations from a field installation for their novel ESP that was relatively new to market. So this product was expected to address a range of conventional ESP production issues, including slugging wells, high gas content fluid, high sand content, and heavy oil, while not requiring significant modifications to existing ESP installations. So basically what they were providing or offering to market was an equal replacement for a conventional ESP that failed in service. So while the manufacturer already had the technology developed, it was, uh, and it had been employed in, in the field as, as test bases, there was not any real performance data with any fluids other than water and field data, which they found was not necessarily adjustable. And of course, the field installations were not heavily instrumented. So you might get uh, one or two pressure measurements and, and one or two temperature measurements, and that may be about it. So what the manufacturer was looking to do here was, was determine the complete operation envelope of gas volume fraction and high viscosity for their pump system. So the manufacturer reached out to Swery to help validate this technology using a custom test facility. So the GVF test loop uh, was designed to generate field realistic conditions of pressure flow and gas content on a scaled version of their ESP. So you can see on the picture that the overall dimensions of the the ESP that includes a, includes a motor and casing and all was about 50 feet tall, 48 feet. The actual pump component or pump portion of it was about 13 feet. So what's not shown here is that the loop was heavily instrumented and allowed for measurements of pump pressure and temperature gain at each pump stage and also uh, vibration 
at each operating condition. Uh, we had uh, accelerometers strategically placed on the pump assembly to just see when the pump was in a dynamic condition, uh, what was the resultant vibration at, at any given GVF and pump speed. So again, due to the proprietary nature of the testing, the data presented here is in a non-dimensional format. However, some trends can be observed. Each line represents a fixed operating fee, uh, speed for the pump assembly, with the green line being the highest frequency and the blue line being the lowest tested. So from the data, you can see a distinct drop in pump performance from the zero GVF condition to the maximum GVF tested, uh, which I can't say what that number was, but it was well above 70%. So as I mentioned earlier, conventional ESPs using a mixed flow centrifugal tight pump stage would likely have become gas locked at 25 to 30% GBF and eventually the motor would have failed and the pump system would have had to have been removed. So for from this data, this, this manufacturer could see their system was still operational well above that regime, still providing some pressure boost though though much less than at the lower GVF conditions, but ultimately this system wouldn't have failed. And that gave them some confidence in their design and, and confidence as far as advertising this product to, to meet that flow regime. So other testing was performed and the, da the data is not shown here, but we saw correlations between the pump inlet pressure and GVF performance. So this testing was supported by baseline testing using water through all operating frequencies. So again, what this manufacturer was able to show through this testing was uh, that the independent data proves that the novel pump technology was still operable where other conventional ESPs would have failed. So what did the manufacturer learn? All of these findings can be used to improve performance models against real fluids and can be further utilized to enhance product design and marketing to industry, which is ultimately was their goal, is to enter this product into market as a as an improvement to conventional ESPs. The data also gave their customer ability to explore operational envelope of the product in a controlled environment that allowed for repeatable conditions. So what we could do with with our test loop was go back to 70% GVF and see if the pump repeated that condition, um, which is something you cannot do in the field. You're stuck with the uh, fluid flow, the, whatever the operational conditions are in the field. This allowed us to modify them on the on the fly. And lastly, a vibration, a vibration analysis was also performed, which allowed the manufacturer to determine the operations scenarios that are problematic for the pump system. And again, this type of measurement was not possible in a field installation. Uh, so although I'm not presenting this slide as, as uh, specifically a test case, I can just kind of highlight some of the other testing we've done here at uh, Southwest Research. Uh, regarding ESPs. So for some of the other ESP validation tests we performed on site, uh, we've explored um, gas lock conditions on vertical ESPs uh, and a casing with the downhole drive motor were installed. So as I mentioned earlier, gas lock is a major failure of ESPs in the field. It contributes to lost production and equipment downtime. This this assembly shown was developed as a custom test loop, uh, which allowed us to perform two-phase testing at field-like conditions and to vary the fluids, GVF, pump inlet pressure, and pump speed to determine operation envelope for a variety of gas separators, uh, both static and dynamic. A second failure mode explored is caused by erosion. We have performed a sand slurry erosion test on an ESP assembly using a recirculating loop with a water-based slurry with silica sand. Uh, so the slurry was composed of 1% sand by volume 
and water uh, and a water viscosified agent to kind of keep all the sand in, in solution. So for this scenario, the pump performance is monitored as a function of erosion exposure time for a fixed particle content. So you circulated the sand slurry through the pump for X amount of hours and basically disassembled the pump to see how much it eroded and whether uh, coatings or other different materials would, would uh, offer improvement. So in summary, uh, through testing and evaluation, operators may see a huge return on investment. Uh, by taking this physical testing step, uh, by taking this physical testing a step further and coupling the data with computational analysis, you can yield uh, more targeted results, as we saw in the case with the gas lift valve. Product failures can be extremely costly to the project's schedule and budget. So understanding the limits of the artificial lift tech is imperative. This can be accomplished through validation testing of the known failure modes and as mentioned in here on the slide, if you do know what failure modes occur on your technology, it's important to start with the highest consequence failures and work your way down to the lower consequences failures. This will help you understand the product a little better and maybe find ways to, to get improvement on whether it's the design or the material selection or something. So in conclusion, uh, unconventional oil and gas wells represent the next big growth opportunity, but artificial lift options have to address some critical performance issues. So this can be accomplished through education, innovation, and new technology. The artificial lift market is estimated at about $14 billion annually, with the majority of wells being located in North America, Russia, and Southeast Asia. So with the advent of the conventional boom, North America has been the primary driver for artificial lift demand in recent years. In the U.S. alone, over 95% of whales require artificial lift, with the bulk of these utilizing rod pumps. As I mentioned before, you know, intervention costs and production downtime can be in the tens of thousands to millions of dollars, depending on the site. So early diagnosis of a failure modes or verification of performance can be extremely valuable. For this reason, CFD and scale testing can prove invaluable to product design and ensuring that the product meets performance expectations before it's placed into a field condition where the, the cost will then of course uh, skyrocket compared to a, a test program, small test program. And as I mentioned, in several of the lab uh, cases, it's really difficult to instrument field sites and usually will require shutdown, which translates to lost revenue to implement. And also uh, requires specialized staff to operate and interpret the data gathered from all these additional instrumentation. So therefore, uh, independent lab testing could be a valuable resources because it offers controlled, repeatable conditions and the opportunity for well-instrumented assemblies when compared to a field installation. So this concludes the webinar on artificial lift testing methods. I would like to thank you for your time. And should you have any questions, comments, or want further information about Southwest Research Institute or the information presented in this webinar, please feel free to contact contact me at the email shown. This is joe.marroquin at swri.org. Uh, so once again, thank you for your time.